Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. I'm Patty. I'm an alcoholic. I'm grateful to be sober. I'm grateful to be in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to thank my friend Don for inviting me, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to participate in my recovery. I'm a little distressed. I just found out this afternoon that my friend has never ridden on a train. So, uh, if there's anybody in this room who has any connections with the railroad, please put him in a box car and take him somewhere. <laughs> I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love being here. I love everything about Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a little disturbed by the not drinking part, but um, I think you have to take all of it together. I, uh, my sponsor always tells me when I'm going to do this, she always gives me the same direct, dreary direction. She always says to me, tell him your name and tell him the truth. I've already told you my name. I'm not so sure I'm going to tell you the truth. And the reason for that is clear to me. I mean, I don't know about anybody else in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I never knew that what it used to be like was going to be important. If I would have known that I was at, when I was out there, that I would be here tonight, expected to report to you what it used to be like, I would have paid more attention to my life. <laughs> if I would have known I was going to report what it used to be like, I can guarantee you I would not have done some of the things that I did. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't know it was going to be important, so I didn't pay a lot of attention. Coupled with that, I'm a blackout drinker. I love blackouts. I love blackouts. I love, 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 love blackouts. Nothing more exciting for me than leaving work on March 8th, going back on March 12th, and discovering I'd been there the entire time. It just, um, it makes time between paychecks so much shorter. But, um, but if you're a blackout drinker and you're not paying a lot of attention, it makes what it used to be like a little fuzzy. So a lot of what I report to you has been reported to me by other people. And I just have to believe they're telling me the truth. Coupled with that, I have a job. I had to get a fingerprint clearance for my job. I fingerprint really, really well. I roll right along with the printer. I don't go too fast. I don't resist it. I just roll right along. And I'm rolling along with the fingerprinter and... I didn't want to raise any red flags, so I very casually said, well, how far back are you going to check? And she looked me in the eye and said, from the day you were born. And I thought, oh, my God, it's like a fifth step, only it's in the wrong order, because they're going to know about it before I do. And um, the book Alcoholics Anonymous says more will be revealed. It doesn't say how. So they sent my prints off. And I don't know if you have any uh, interactions with non-alcoholic people. But non-alcoholic people, when they're going to give us what they think is bad news, they're sometimes a little hesitant about it. And this woman called me, and she was really hesitant. And she said, you know, your report came back. And I said, uh-huh. She said, normally these reports are two or three pages long. I said, uh-huh. She said, yours was 56 pages. <laughs> Do you want to see it? Well, of course I did. So I went down there, and I read that report. And I can tell you this, I know a lot more about what it used to be like <laughs> since I read that report than I did before. So I don't know if this story is true. I like the story, so I just keep telling it. Um, I didn't have my first drink of alcohol until I was 13 years old. I'm really sorry I waited that long. I, I had no idea what alcohol would do to me or for me. I don't remember ever thinking I can't wait until I drink. I certainly never thought I would never drink. But I don't remember thinking about alcohol at all. And yet I'm 13 years old. I'm on a camping trip. We're camped on the beach just south of Oceanside in Southern California. I remember that Friday night. I remember getting into the tent as clear as if it were tonight. I remember getting into that tent, and in my pillowcase I had a bottle of vodka. I have no idea where that bottle came from. I've always believed it was the grace of God. <laughs> But I've never been able to confirm that. But uh, I had no idea what alcohol would do to me or for me, but I remember being excited about having it. And I asked if anybody wanted any, and they didn't. And the reason they gave me for not wanting it was all we had to mix with it was grape soda and root beer. And I said, well, so what? And I took off the top, and I drank half the bottle. 
I looked around the tent. Nothing had gotten different. Nothing had changed. So I drank the second half of the bottle, and that was to be the end of my social drinking. <laughs> Never again after that day did I ever offer anybody a drink out of my bottle. And, uh, <laughs> Anybody else in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I never got resentments until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I never had resentments out there. But one of my early resentments in Alcoholics Anonymous is I heard you talk about your first drink, and you described it. You talked about the warmth in your mouth, and you described how it felt as it trickled down your throat, and it went down and it hit your stomach and it exploded. And it went to your fingernails and your toenails, and you grew a couple inches taller, and you dropped 20 pounds, and your pimples fell off, and, <laughs> and wonderful things happened to you. And that wasn't the case for me. I had my first drink of alcohol, and absolutely nothing happened to me for about 15 minutes. And, um, and at the end of the 15 minutes, the only thing that happened to me is I had to go to the bathroom. And it's my belief tonight that if I were to drink a quart of anything, in about 15 minutes, I'd have to go to the bathroom. So I got out of the tent, and I shoveled through the sand to the outhouse, and I went in and went to the bathroom. And when I got done and went to get up, I realized I was absolutely and totally 100% paralyzed to the toilet seat. I couldn't move. I couldn't even blink. I didn't feel my heart beating, and I was overcome with a sense of fear. And, of course, the fear was that somebody else was going to have to come use that outhouse, and there I was, paralyzed to the toilet seat. Now... Later in my drinking, I did discover that two people can use the same toilet at the same time. <laughs> Second person's got to be really careful, but it can be done. <laughs> I didn't know that at 13, though, but I somehow knew that the body was made up of energy, and I somehow figured if I could gather my energy, I would be all right. So I've always referred to it as my first formal meditation, because I sat and I gathered my energy. And when it seemed to be in one place, when it seemed to be centrally located, I just sort of fell off the toilet, out the door, into the sand, and started crawling back to the tent. Now, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, you explained to me that my entire problem that night was my attitude. If my attitude would have been right, I could have had a fantasy. I was in the Marines. I was being dive bombed as I was trying to get back to safety. And if my attitude would have been right, it could have been a wonderful experience. Now, in my own defense, I always have to tell you my pants were still down at my ankles. <laughs> I had started to get sick. I couldn't quite get through it. I couldn't get around it. And I've always contended under those circumstances, it's a little difficult to have a good attitude. I did somehow manage to get back to the tent. I fell in and I passed out. When I came to in the morning, I realized nobody was in the tent with me, and I couldn't figure out where they went until my eyes cleared enough that I realized I'd been sick all night long. I'd hit the top of the tent, the side of the tent, the floor of the tent. I hadn't missed a square inch, and uh, quite frankly, I didn't want to be in the tent either, so I got out of there. And that was my first drink of alcohol. And it was the most wonderful, amazing, incredible, marvelous spiritual experience I'd ever had. And it must have been because I put some amount of alcohol into my body from that day until the day I came through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't always get drunk, and I didn't always drink the kinds of things that you would classify as a beverage. I drank a lot of vanilla extract. I used to buy it by the six-pack. I just recently found out they make vanilla extract without alcohol in it anymore, which I think is a total ripoff for our children. <laughs> but, um, I remember the day the guy at the market called me over. He said, Patty, I can't let you buy vanilla extract anymore. He says, I can't believe, believe anybody bakes as much as you do. And I got cut off from that supply, drank a lot of mouthwash. I drank a lot of perfume. Taboo became my after-dinner drink of choice. I still have a weakness. If you're wearing it, I may follow you too closely and laugh at your neck. I still have a weakness for it. But, um, but you know what fascinates me? As alcoholics, we know stuff. I mean, how do we know that stuff? We just sort of intuitively know stuff. My next-door neighbors who are not alcoholics, they've been to my house a few times. They have never once eaten or drank a single thing out of my bathroom. But we we just sort of know. We know that stuff. And um, I'm a bar drinker. I'm a living room drinker, an alley drinker, a car drinker, a dumpster drinker, an office drinker, a grocery store drinker. I don't really specialize. I just drink. Uh, but I love bars. I love sleazy, nasty, disgusting bars. I'm <laughs> 
I know you got some around here, I'm telling you. Don took me to Old Town Sacramento, and I saw some potentials down there, but he wouldn't let me go in any of them. He just pointed them out. But they're the kind of places with sawdust on the floor. The mirrors are cracked, so you kind of have to dip around to see yourself in there. Posts around the bars ripped, or people have tried to hold on as they're falling off their bar stool. And it's always a nice touch if there's a piece of broken furniture in a corner somewhere. And they used to be full of smoke. I understand you can't smoke in a bar in California anymore, which makes absolutely no sense to me. I drank in bars for guys that take a piss against the wall. Apparently they can still do that, but they can't smoke in there. <laughs> but they used to be full of smoke, and they had that wonderful used booze urine smell that I, I salivate still. I love that smell. I'll, I'll tell you what, sometimes if I'm in a cranky mood, I'll go buy one of those joints, open the door, take a hit off of that, and it just perks me up for the rest of the day. <laughs> fascinated by the quality of people who drink in those places. And there were CEOs of big companies, there were bank presidents, there were admirals in the Air Force, neurosurgeons. I mean, that's what they said they were. And I. <laughs> but we weren't having conversations like, well, what do you prefer, the red mouthwash or the green? Well, what's your preference, Chantilly or Aqua Velva? We're not having those kinds of conversations, so it doesn't occur to me I'm living any different than anybody else. I think I drink because I want to drink. I don't know that I don't have a choice. I don't know that at 13 years old I put alcohol into an alcoholic body. And that day on, from that day on, I had no choice. I think I drink because I want to drink. I had an opportunity to go to college. I went to San Diego State. Graduated from San Diego State with a 3.8 grade point average. In retrospect, I can tell you I was a chronic, hopeless, helpless alcoholic. I'm drinking on a daily basis. I'm a blackout drinker. And I graduated from college with a 3.8 grade point average. I stayed at San Diego and took classes for a master's degree. I'm one of those people, I'm doing something well, I want to keep doing it. And apparently I do school well. So I stayed and took classes for a master's degree. I left San Diego because I had taken all the classes San Diego State had to offer. My disease manifests itself in rationalization, justification, and denial. No matter what it is I do, I explain to you why I'm doing it. As I'm explaining it to you, I'm hearing it. As I'm hearing it, I'm believing it. And I think I'm leaving San Diego because I've taken all the classes San Diego State has to offer. I don't think I'm leaving because I have one more drunk driving assault charge pending. And uh, another resentment I got in Alcoholics Anonymous, I found out here you can get arrested for a single charge of drunk driving. I never knew that. I always got arrested for drunk driving assault. And it had something to do with how I got out of the car. And, um, <laughs> and here's the thing. I'm driving down the street. The light comes on behind me. I pull over. The officer walks up. Now, the first thing I do is slam my car door open. My intent is, is to knock him in the private parts. But <laughs> men are a little fussy about their private parts. So as the door is flying open, he jumps back to protect himself. And when he jumps back, it's really a good thing because now he's far enough away that I can get him in focus. And I think, one of him, one of me. One of him, one of me. I think I can take him. One of him, one of me. I think I'll try and I go for him. Really good fight for a couple of minutes. I was a lot younger then, but it was a good fight for a couple of minutes. But I wouldn't remember that back at the car he had a friend. And the friend had a radio. And the friend would call some more friends. And pretty soon it would be two or three of them, one of me. Well, it's not fair anymore. And I say, uncle. And they take me away. And... Next time the light comes on behind me, I pull over. The officer walks up, I slam my car door open, try and knock him in the private parts. He jumps back to protect himself. He gets far enough away and get him in focus. And I think, one of him, one of me. One of him, one of me, I think I can take him. One of him, one of me, I think I'll try and go for him. Wouldn't remember the friend, the radio, and the friend's friend. And uh, pretty soon, before five of them, one of me, it's not fair anymore, saying, come on and take me away. I didn't do that once or twice. I did that three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times. Never remembered the friend, the radio, and the friend's friend. <laughs> and that's the insanity of my disease. The insanity of my disease is I do the same thing over and over, and I think the results are going to be different. This time it's a fair fight. This time I'm going to take him. And I don't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing, but I drank during a time when the state of California didn't get their underwear in such a knot about drunk driving. I, I'm 
understand they're pretty testy about it now, but um, I never had any consequence. Well, they took my license from me, but you don't really need that to drive a car. I, I never really had any consequences. I paid an attorney a thousand dollars, which was a lot of money, and he'd make a phone call, he'd write a letter, and that'd kind of be the end of it. I'd never hear any more about it, but. One time I had two pending at the same time, and my attorney was nervous. I think if your attorney's nervous, you should worry about it. <laughs> so I'm sitting in a bar worrying about the fact that my attorney's nervous. And um, I just started talking to this guy sitting next to me, and as luck would have it, he worked in a mortuary. And I came up with a plan. I think alcoholics, I think we come up with really good plans really quickly. The problem for me, typically, is that my solution is worse than the original problem. <laughs> Which is why at 36 years sober, I am still actively sponsored. Because still today, sometimes my solutions are worse than the original problem. But I didn't have a sponsor then, so we went over the mortuary. We got a death certificate. We put my name on it. We filled out all the pertinent information. <laughs> We forged a doctor's signature and we sent it to the court because they can't expect a lot from you if you're dead. <laughs> so I called my attorney and I told him he didn't need to worry. And he didn't worry, I didn't worry, nobody worried for, I don't know, it was 60, 90, 100 days, I don't know what it was, and the light came on behind me again. <laughs> and this time the judge wanted to see me. I couldn't figure out why he wanted to see me, never wanted to see me before, but you know what, I'm game, I'll go. And um, I'll never forget him, he's looking down at me, he said, Miss Ochoa, tell me, how is it a dead person is standing in my court? And I shrugged my shoulders, and with all sincerity, I looked at him and said, I don't know, bad luck? And, um, and that's what I thought it was, it was bad it was circumstances and conditions. It was the cops. It was you and they and them. It was a lot of things that never occurred to me had anything to do with alcohol. Never occurred to me. And when you get out of the car like that, they attach an assault charge. They don't care that they won the fight. Drunk driving assault. Drunk driving assault. And, uh, and I don't think I'm leaving San Diego because I have one more drunk driving assault charge pending. I think I'm leaving San Diego because I've taken all the classes San Diego State has to offer. <laughs> Rationalization, justification, and denial. I was offered a job in Chico, California, which is about as far north as you can get. I loaded everything I owned into my car, took some, some beer and some booze, and I headed north. I got to Santa Ana, which, um, <laughs> which isn't the place you want to shoot for, but I got to Santa Ana, I was out of booze, and I was thirsty. I pulled off the freeway. I have a sense I can find the sleaziest bar in town without even looking for it. I pulled into the parking lot of this place. I walked in. It was full of smoke. had that wonderful used booze, urine smell. Willie Nelson was singing on the jukebox, and I knew I was home. It's as far north as I ever got, 88 miles from where I started from. <laughs> had become my mother, my father, my God, my friend, my lover, my companion, my support. And at some point it had turned, and I've always believed it was in the middle of my first drink. At some point it had turned, it began to strip me of self-esteem, self-worth, dignity, de integrity, decency, honesty, all the things we have going for us as human beings. And long before I got to you, it had taken it all. Long before I got to you, alcohol controlled every year of my life. Where I would live, where I would play, the people I would run with, and eventually the people I would run from. And I thought I drank because I wanted to drink. I didn't know that I didn't have a choice. I didn't know that at 13 years old I put alcohol into an alcoholic body. And from that day on I had no choice. I went into the profession of my choice. I rose very quickly to the top. That too almost killed me in Alcoholics Anonymous because when I got here I told you I was too successful to be an alcoholic. I told you about the big oak desk I sat behind. I told you about the trophies and the plaques. What I didn't tell you about I was in the newspaper business. I didn't tell you about the times that I would come out of a blackout standing behind a podium much like this in a room full of people holding an award, not knowing if I was giving it or receiving it. And, uh, I would say thank you and I would go sit down and then somebody would elbow me and tell me I was presenting it to the junior farmers and I'd have to get up and start over again. And uh, I didn't tell you that, I just told you I was too successful to be an alcoholic. I, because I was in the newspaper business, I had to go to the bar every night I probably didn't want to go to the bar every night. I probably some nights wanted to go home and have a little dinner and watch TV. But when you're in that business, 
you have to go to the bar because that's where the news is. That's where the leads are. That's where you get the stories. Now, since coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, I've discovered if you work at the grocery store, you have to go to the bar after work. If you're a bus driver, you go to the bar after work. If you're a construction worker, you go to the bar. If you're unemployed, you go to the bar instead of working. But, uh, <laughs> but I thought uh, rationalization, justification, and denial was part of my job. We work hard all day, and then you go to the bar. Now, I did, I did get a lot of leads in the bar. I have to say that I got a lot of, a lot of really good information. The, the problem was I would write the notes on those little napkins and then my glass would run, would sweat and the ink would run. And then in the morning I'd get that napkin and I'd be like trying to read it and thinking, my God, I'm gonna have to go back there again tonight. I hope that guy's there again tonight. And <laughs> I got a really big story one time, uh, I did a six-part expose on one of our local school board guys, a married man with six kids, and I exposed an extramarital affair, which today is almost required. Forty years ago, it was news. But I, uh, I exposed this big affair that he was having. The story ran for six, six issues. The story ran never once while that story was running did it ever occur to me I was the woman he was having the affair with. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a thinker. You know what? I've always been a thinker. I, I, every once in a while I hear us tell newcomers, don't think. Now I don't know how you do that. I think all the time. When I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about something else. Then I start thinking I shouldn't be thinking what I'm thinking while I'm thinking what I shouldn't be thinking. Then I try not to think about what I'm thinking. Now, I'm just telling you what, I'm grateful I don't have a loudspeaker on my head. So everything I thought came barreling out. I mean, that would be truly humiliating. But, uh, but I think all the time. I always have. And I'm, I'm, uh, and uh, I don't know about other alcoholics, but I always had bad car karma. I always had cars that were like really kind of trashy. I don't know how it happens to alcoholics, but I know I'm not the only one. But one night I leave the bar and I'm driving home and I'm thinking, because I always think. And I'm thinking, and I'm driving home and I turned left onto my street and just as I turned left, the power steering went out of my car. And I slammed into a car on the left hand side of the street. And I panicked, so I turned the wheel just a little bit and I slammed into a car on the right. I slammed into one on the left, I slammed into one on the right, <laughs> took out one on the left. I finally pulled into my driveway. I was so relieved that I had gotten home safely. <laughs> I just sat there in a moment of gratitude. And uh, <laughs> after a few minutes, I got out of the car and I went in the house. And I couldn't have been in the house maybe five, ten minutes at the most. The doorbell rang. I looked at my wife. It is 20 after 2 in the morning. Who wants me now? <laughs> People always want you. They never leave you alone. They're always in your business. I open the door. It's the Orange County Sheriff. I said, do you know what time it is? <laughs> and he wanted me to come out on the lawn. So you know, I come out, I'm telling him about my car. Apparently he's not mechanical. He doesn't care about my car. He's pointing to all these cars. They're just smashed out. And I said to him, isn't it great I got home safely? <laughs> And he opened the back door of the car and he wanted me to get in. Now I've been on the ride along. I don't have time for the ride along tonight. Thank you. And he wants me in the car. I don't have time. He wants me in the car. And I don't know about the sheriff in Sacramento, but in Orange County, they are tenacious. And I finally got in the car just to shut him up. And I got in the car and he shackled my ankles and he cuffed my hands because I have a reputation as a violent drunk. Only I don't know it. When you get out of the car the way I get out of the car, you get a reputation. But rationalization, justification, I don't know. And he shackles me and he starts driving. And we have a fence between the front seat and the back seat in our cars. And he's driving me on the ride along and pretty soon he's on the freeway. And I'm telling him you don't go on the freeway on the ride along. The ride along's on the surface streets. And he keeps driving on the freeway and I'm telling him again. And he's not, he's ignoring me and I, I don't like being ignored. <laughs> and I don't know what happened. The devil flew in me or something and um, I just honked up a big one and I just spit right on the back of his head. <laughs> See, you're kind of amused. He wasn't amused at all. He was, he sped up, and when the speedometer hit 100 miles an hour, he slammed on the brake. And I'm shackled, and I'm cuffed, and I can't break the fall. I went face forward into that metal grate, and remember my glasses broke. There was blood everywhere. It was a mess. I'll never forget that night, though. They were taking my mug shot. They kept referring to me as Waffle Face, because I said that. <laughs> I didn't have a clue. 
absolutely did not have a clue. I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous with what I pray God was my last drunk driving assault charge. In 1975, the state of California was starting to get their underwear in a knot about people barreling down the freeway at 80 miles an hour, blowing something in the breathalyzer above their grade point average. And uh, <laughs> I got pulled over one more time, and I was taking the field sobriety test. I'm good at field sobriety tests. I practice field sobriety tests. I'm, I'm one of those people, I get released from jail, I get the police report, I read it. I find out where I made my mistakes so I can practice that part <laughs> so that next time I'll get that part right. And I always knew there'd be a next time. I always knew. Because I had a high-profile job. The cops were always looking for me. They knew what I drove. They knew what I drove if I had my car, your car, a company car. They knew what I drove if I had a stolen car. I mean, they always knew what I drove, and they were always looking for me. So I practice field sobriety tests a lot. And when I pray God was the last drunk driving assault, I was doing an A job. I mean, I was touching my finger to my nose, walking heel to toe. Tonight I can stand one foot for 45 minutes. And uh, I even mentioned to the officer I thought I was doing A-plus work. And at the end of it, he asked me to say the ABCs backwards. Well, the time before I had responded with, well, I can't even do that sober. Well, then I had just confessed. <laughs> And I had just confessed, and he cuffed me, he took me off to jail. So on the last one, when he asked me to say the ABCs backwards, I said, okay, and I turned around. <laughs> See, you think it was funny. He wasn't even amused. I, I was turned around, he cuffed me, took me to Orange County Jail, he put me in the cell with criminals. I mean, real criminals. They were like prostitutes, burglars. Women had been arrested for beating their husband, which I don't think should be a crime, but in California they locked you up for it. And, uh, and I knew I didn't belong there, so I tried to organize a prison break. And I came up with a plan. I explained it very carefully and very slowly to the criminals. Easy plan. We're going to get our coffee cups. We're going to bang them on the bars. When the marshal comes to see what's going on, I'm throwing my arm around her neck. We're getting her keys, and we're getting out of here. Simple plan. I heard something I was to hear in Alcoholics Anonymous. One of those criminals looked at me, and she said, why don't you sit down and shut up? And uh, I said, fine, then y'all stay, but I'm getting out. I sound like a mad woman on those bars. A couple problems with styrofoam cups. The first, first one is they don't make a lot of noise. second one is the bars have a tendency to eat them up. And the bars ate it up, and it got to my knuckles, and it got painful. I sat down, and I shut up. And I got released on an OR, and I went to court on that charge. I was 26 years old. I was drunk in court that morning, so only way I went to court, the grocery store, the laundromat, to work, to school, to anything. I said they're drunk that morning in court, 26 years old. I had the public defender standing next to me the day the $1,000 attorney was gone. The only thing I wanted to do since I was in the fourth grade was be a writer. I had an opportunity to go into that profession. I gave it up for one more drink. If it came between a job and a drink, I took a drink. A relationship and a drink, I took a drink. Anything and a drink, I took a drink. And I'd given up my profession for one more drink, and I was unemployed and unemployable. I was 26 years old, and I was drunk. And the state of California was starting to pass out serious consequences, and I was, and I was being sentenced to 10 years in prison. I have a son as a direct result of my alcoholism. I never wanted to be a mother. found out that is not adequate birth control. And I, uh, I didn't like this kid. He didn't do anything. He wet and he cried. You think at eight months old he'd get a little part-time job. Um, and I didn't like him, but I was willing to use him that morning. And I told the judge he couldn't put me in jail because I was a single parent and I was self-supported through my own contributions. And he told me he'd put my son in a foster home because I was an unfit mother. And I was being sentenced. In the middle of sentencing me, the expression on his face changed. The tone of his voice got different. And I know he was as surprised at what he was saying as I was at what I was hearing. Because he looked at me and he said, I know this won't work for you, but I'm going to offer you one more chance. And he offered me an alternative, and part of that alternative was meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I wish I could tell you I took the alternative. I came here, I looked at the 12 steps, and knew, knew they were the solution to the problems in my life, worked them all in the first week and skyrocketed to recovery. And uh, sometimes when I'm not being taped, I do tell that story, but... Um, <laughs> It's not my story. I, I thought, stood in court and thought about it. Jail alternative. Jail, I've been to jail. There's more alcohol and other drugs some days in the institution than there are on the street. If you know what to do, who to do it to, and you're willing to go to any lengths, and always was. Jail alternative. Bill writes in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, something to, the, to this effect. He writes, to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis. And he goes on to say, this is not always an easy choice for us to be doomed to an alcoholic death. And I don't think Bill means the kind of death where you have the decency to lay down and they put dirt on your face. 
I think the alcoholic death that Bill talks about is to continue to live in the incomprehensible demoralization, to continue to live in the shame, to continue to live dreaming dreams and planning plans and not being able to get off the bar stool to get it done, to continue to live promising the people who love us that we won't do it again, and promising that and promising and promising, and then we do it again. And then we see that look in their eye, the look that says, what's wrong? Don't you love me enough? What's wrong with me? What have I done wrong? I think that's the alcoholic death that Bill talks about, to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis. If you're new here tonight, I want you to know the reality is this is not an easy choice. It wasn't an easy choice for any of us. And I think that's the choice I was being asked to make that morning. And I had that morning when I know tonight was a moment of clarity. Because as clear as I knew anything, I knew if I went to jail one more time, I'd either die in the institution or I'd become institutionalized for life. And I took the alternative and I left the courtroom and I drank for three more months. In retrospect, I can tell you I didn't drink a greater quantity of alcohol. Physically, it would have been impossible to drink a greater quantity. But I drank with a sense of urgency and a desperation that I had never known. And on October 4th, 1975, the day before I was to go back to court to tell the judge what it was I was doing with the alternative he gave me, on that day I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't know what ANA was. I thought it was something like the PGA or Parents Without Partners. And, uh, and a lot of days it is. I mean, just... <laughs> as far as I know, I had never heard the words Alcoholics Anonymous before. I had no idea what you were going to do to me or for me. And my first meeting was a speaker meeting, and I can't tell you who talked that night. But I heard two things. I heard we don't drink between meetings. But I quickly looked around and didn't see any of you drinking in the meeting. And I thought, if you're not drinking in the meeting and you don't drink between the meetings, when do you drink? And I don't know how it impacts other newcomers, but it made me really nervous. I couldn't figure out why the judge sent me to a place where people didn't drink. I would have understood if he sent me to Sears School of Safe Driving. I did not understand why he sent me to a place where people didn't drink. And the other thing I heard was that the answers were in that book, Alcoholics Anonymous. So after the meeting, I stole the book. I mean, God knows I need to have the answers. I can't tell you how irritated I was. I went home and read the book. Not only could I not find the answers in that book, I couldn't even find the questions. And I thought, oh, dear God, I've stolen the wrong book, and I'm going to have to go back. I'm going to have to go back and get the right one. And uh, Wednesday, with four days of sobriety, I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous to get the answer book. I don't think it matters why you come back. I don't think it matters what your motives are, what your intentions are, what your desires are. I think what's important is what your actions are. Wednesday, with four days of sobriety, I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous to get the answer book. And in that meeting, I heard, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it. And I looked around the room, and I looked around the room, and I looked around the room. I could not figure out what it was you had that was so hot that I should be willing to go to any lengths to get it. <laughs> I mean, really, look at the person next to you, unless you're sleeping with them. What is it? I mean, I could not, I could not figure out what it was, and then I saw him. And I truly believe there's a him for each of us. This guy was a skinny little fellow. He was bald-headed. He wore baggy pants, not like the kids do today. I work with teenagers. I work with teenagers who wear pants that have absolutely no relationship to their body size. And, uh, <laughs> They're really, they're so baggy they could put a homeless family in there with them, but um, <laughs> his weren't that baggy, but they were baggy. He had tennis shoes on with no shoelaces, but the holes were there where they should have been, and he nodded out during the meeting. And I quickly assessed the situation. I figured he was shooting heroin. Folks who shoot heroin nod out, and I could probably do this thing and not drink if I could shoot a little heroin. So I found out where he worked, and I snuck down to his office the next day. And I said, Dick, I have to do this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous to stay out of jail, and I don't know how to do it. And he told me if I would go to meetings and read the book and talk to other alcoholics and not drink, so I guarantee you won't get drunk. And if you don't get drunk, your life will get different. And I'm grateful he told it to me that way. He didn't tell me my life would get better. He didn't tell me my family life would get better, my job life would get better, my finances would get better, my social life would get better, my sex life would get better. He didn't tell me any of it would get better, and I'm grateful, because none of it has. <laughs> it's a little hope for the newcomer but, uh, <laughs> but it's all gotten different and as I stand here tonight I can tell you from the top of my head to the tip of my toes I have never had it so good so I don't know good from bad for me I'm going through something I think is good for me and it generally turns out to be bad for me I'm going through something I think is bad for me and it generally turns out to be good for me I don't know good from bad for me but I know different 
And every area of my life is different than it was the day I came to the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've gone through some painful times. And life is, sometimes life is painful, not just for alcoholics, but for people. Sometimes life is painful. I've gone through some really painful times in the last 36 years. And I'm rather dramatic, so I was referred to it as the dark night of the soul. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're going through it, then I just tell you to get over yourself. But, uh, <laughs> but in those times, if I don't drink and don't die and don't drink and don't die and get far enough beyond it to look back in retrospect, I have always seen that every time I thought my life was falling apart. What was really happening is it was falling together. And it had to be exactly that way for God to move me to where he'd have me be. So I don't know good from bad for me, but I know different. And every area of my life is different than it was the day I walked through doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I believe that old man. And I don't know why I believed him. I didn't believe the human being in a very long time. My perspective, as a small child, I, people hurt me all my life. As a small child, I learned that if you love me, you would hurt me. And if I love you, I would hurt you. And I learned that if you said you'd be there, you weren't. And I learned as a small child that I just made a decision that I just don't want to be hurt anymore. And I clearly remember starting to build a brick wall to keep you out. And I built a brick wall to keep you out simply because I don't want to be hurt anymore. And that brick wall worked really well. It kept you out. What I never knew about that brick wall is it made me a prisoner inside. I lived behind that wall in isolation and loneliness. And alcohol didn't allow me to come out and play. Alcohol just made it okay for me to be back there. And when you live behind a wall like that, you don't believe and you don't trust. Now, I hadn't believed a human being in a very long time, but I believed that old man. And I didn't know why then, but I know why tonight. I believed him because of the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. One alcoholic talking to another. One alcoholic talking to another goes through that brick wall. And I believed that old man. I had the books every night. I'd open it to the chapter that says most of us are unwilling to admit we are real alcoholics. I'd say amen and close the book, and, and that was reading the book. <laughs> I'd go down to the Canyon Club in Laguna Beach where they have AA meetings. I'd have a cup of coffee. On the way out, I'd say hi, Jim, to the manager. He'd say hi, Patty. That was talking to another alcoholic. My court program said I had to go to two meetings a week. I thought that was really obsessive, but I was willing to go to any lengths to stay out of jail. And the only thing I did right is I didn't drink. And I didn't drink, and I didn't drink, and I didn't drink. And I've heard people say, it, you know, it's not been necessary for me to drink. I want you to know it's been incredibly necessary for me to drink. <laughs> it's been an emergency for me to drink. I had an obsession to drink for the first two years I was sober. My experience is this. You can stay sober with an obsession to drink. And I didn't drink, and I didn't drink, and I didn't drink. And I, I've been in pain, like I said, in 36 years. But I have never been in the kind of pain that I was in eight and a half months away from my last drink. The pain of not drinking and not recovering. The pain of not drinking and not recovering is the greatest pain I've ever been in. And eight and a half months away from my last drink, that pain drove me to my knees. And on my knees, I took the first step of recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. I admitted to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. And the book says this is the first step in recovery. I admitted to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. I was not a kind and loving, sweet newcomer. Um, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. The only emotion I knew was anger, and I acted it out in violence. I was full of rage. I would, uh, I would be in the back of the meeting, and the speaker would be talking. I wouldn't like what they said. I'd stand up, and I'd just let them know what I said. It was usually all profanities, but I put it together in such a way that it almost sounded like a sentence. <laughs> And I'd spew it out from the back of the room, and then some little lady about my age would turn around and say, keep coming back, and I'd flip her off, and I'd wave, <laughs> wave my court card in her face, tell her I didn't have a choice. You'd try to talk to me, I'd kick at you, spit at you, throw my coffee at you. I'd go to uh, discussion meetings, I'd get mad, and I'd stand up and take the whole table with me. Uh, they used to have little individual coffee pots on the tables, I'd throw them across the room carry the knife in my boot, I'd get irritated, throw it at the literature rack. <laughs> Aimed at a member's eye view, I didn't always hit that, but I'd throw the knife across the room. A guy was sharing one night, and he didn't say anything to me. I just took it personally. I jumped him. I was beating his head into the floor. Uh, it took six guys to get me off of him. I thought they would tell me I couldn't come back. I was trying to get thrown out of AA. It didn't occur to me just to leave, but... Um... <laughs> I knew they were going to tell me not to come back, and when I got, they got me off of him, one of those guys looked at me and he said, Patty, next time that volcano goes off, he said, just put your hands in your pockets and don't touch another human being. And I wondered how he knew about the volcano. 
Nobody had ever talked to me about the volcano before, but that's what I had inside. I had a volcano. And when it erupted, I wanted, I had to do something. When it erupted, I wanted to see blood, preferably yours. And, uh, Alex told me to put my hands in my pockets and not touch another human being. I walked around AA for a long time before I co- discovered that that anger was a cover for a tremendous amount of fear. I was absolutely scared to death. I was afraid of you. I was afraid of life. I was afraid of me. And I'd survived in places where you can't survive if you're afraid. And I'd begin to cover it with anger and act it out in violence. And, uh, and, uh, and thank God the people in Alcoholics Anonymous understood the traditions. Because he never told me to get out. He always said, keep coming back. I think you were hoping I'd go to another meeting. Um, <laughs> but you just said, keep coming back. I was thinking when they were reading the history of their meeting, my home group is a very sick woman's meeting. I go to it because I look healthy, but... Um, <laughs> We started that meeting because I was in a woman's meeting one night, and I used the F word, and everybody got hysterical, so I used it about eight more times in <laughs> 30 seconds. And uh, after the meeting, two women came up, and they told me they didn't want me to come back to their meeting until I could learn to talk like a lady. And I thought, fuck you. And I um, <laughs> called my sponsor and told her I, they threw me out. And she said, well, then start your own meeting. And so we started a woman's meeting. We had rules. You had to use the F word when you shared. <laughs> you couldn't talk about your husband, and we absolutely did not allow any knitting. That was totally against the rules. <laughs> so I'm thinking, how would you report that as your history in a, in a meeting? But um, anyway, I digress. So uh, I think the most... Um, I think the most powerful prayer we have in Alcoholics Anonymous is the seven-step prayer. I love the seven-step prayer. The seven-step prayer says something like this. It says, take all of me, good and bad. How powerful is that for an alcoholic of my nature? Take it all, good and bad. I don't have to judge it anymore. Is it a good thing or a bad thing, a right thing or a wrong thing, or my personal favorite, my will or God's will? I don't know if you have the God's will or my will debate in Sacramento, but... In Orange County, we have the my will or God's will. It's my will or God's will. It's my will or God's will. Here's what I think about God's will. I think God's will is kind of like the GPS in my car. I set it for where I want to go, and then I start driving. And then she says to me, in 150 feet, turn right. Well, I have alcoholism. I don't have alcoholism. So sometimes I get 150 feet, and I think, you know what? I want to turn right. (laughs) So I turn left. And then she reconfigures. Then she'll say, in 200 feet, make a U-turn. Well, in 200 feet, I'm not big on U-turns, so I turn right. And she doesn't say, you know what, you are a lousy driver. (laughs) Pull over, get out of this car, let somebody else, you can't, you're a lousy driver. She does, she just reconfigures. She's kind of like an Al-Anon, reconfigures. plan. And eventually, eventually I get to where I'm supposed to be. And I think that's how God's will is. God puts a, something comes up in front of me and I get to choose to do it or not do it, go through it, around it, over it, and under it. And I do what I do. And if God doesn't say, you know what, you're a lousy AA, get out of here. I presented you with blah, 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 blah. you did blah, 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 get out. God doesn't do that. Just somewhere down the road, something else comes up. And then down the road, something else comes up. And if God just wants me to live happy, joyous, and free, and I think, I, so I don't have to debate it anymore. Good thing, bad thing, right thing, wrong thing, God's will, my will. Just take it all, good and bad. Leave me with this. Leave me with what I need to be of service to you and my fellows. How powerful is that? Selfish and self-centered is the nature of my disease. Selfish and self-centered, that's what walked through the door. I've done very little. I admitted to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. I came to believe the people in AA were telling me the truth. I made a decision to do what you said you had done. I wrote about my favorite topic, me. <laughs> I bored somebody for about an hour and a half having to listen to it. And as a result of those very simple things, I'm now in a position where all I care about is being of service to God and my fellows. How powerful is that? And I think too many of us miss it. Too many of us get our underwear in such a knot about something in the process that we never get there. We never get to the place where all we care about really is being of service to God and our fellows. Eight and nine, for me, were conventional ways of getting rid of conventional guilt. I felt guilty because I was guilty. I did a lot of things to a lot of people for one more drink. 
If it came between anything and a drink, I took a drink. And uh, and I had a lot of unfinished business. I'm a good starter. I'm not a good finisher, but I'm a big star. I love starting stuff. <laughs> and I had to start me. I had to start finishing a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that my sponsor, who has an elementary school education, one of the things that she got focused on was my master's degree. Because I had taken the classes, but I hadn't taken the oral exams. And she wanted me to finish it. I don't want to finish it. I've drank myself out of my profession. I still can't go back into that profession. Why do I want the degree? <laughs> She's on me to finish it. I don't give her all the reasons why I don't want to. <laughs> like a little chihuahua dog. No, 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 no. And uh, finally, I just to shut her up, which is mostly why I do anything, <laughs> I call San Diego, and I get, the, I get the person down there on the phone. I explain to her what I need to do, and she puts me on hold, and she comes back and says, Miss Ochoa, our records indicate you have a master's degree. I said, oh, no, 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 I never finished it. Now, I don't even want this stupid thing, but now I'm obsessed with it. And I start calling all over San Diego. I finally get a hold of the guy that's head of my master's committee. I explain the whole thing to him. And he says to me, Patty, you have your master's degree. I said, but I needed, I had to take two-day oral exams. He said, you did. <laughs> I said, well, how did I do? He said, you were brilliant. I said, well, of course. And uh, <laughs> called my sponsor and told her how she had humiliated me one more time. And... <laughs> friends who really, they think I should call them around. They're pretty sure I have a doctorate somewhere, but, uh, <laughs> but I, got, I got right. And then 10, 11, and 12 keep me in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. 10 says the process is powerful. Keep using it. Keep writing about it, talking about it. Ask God to remove the defect, make amends if necessary, and then turn your attention to somebody you can help. Seems to be a big deal around here. Turn your attention to somebody you can help. Step 11, my prayer in the morning is very simply that I will be done. Um, my, I'm so naive, I truly believe the rest of the day is God's business. My job is to not drink, show up, and live life to the fullest. My prayer at night is a little scarier. Offer to anybody who'd like to use it. I guarantee if you use it for 90 days, it will change your life. My prayer at night is, dear God, please have people treat me tomorrow exactly the way I treated people today. And when I know I'm going to say that prayer tonight, it will hold me in good stead. I don't flip people off on the freeway anymore. I... Uh, I do count, but I don't announce the number of items in the 10 item or less line at the grocery store. <laughs> and when I'm standing in line, I don't act like I'm nearly as important as I think I am um, while I'm standing and waiting. And, and I don't live my life so much out of virtue as I know I'm going to say that prayer tonight. And, uh, and step 12 is the greatest gift you've ever given me, an opportunity to take a little of my past and give it to another alcoholic. To so look into the eyes of another alcoholic and say, honey, you don't have to live that way anymore. Take my hand, come with me, sit in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you don't have to live that way anymore. I have a life beyond my wildest imagination. I have a really wild imagination. Um, my son, who was 11 months old when I got sober, I brought him to AA with me because I didn't know what to do with him. And uh, I brought him here, and you'd hold him for an hour and a half, and at the end of the meeting, you'd give him back to me. And I'd bring him to another meeting, and you'd take him, and then you'd give him back to me. And... Everything my son knows, he learned from the men and women of Alcoholics Anonymous. You've taught him how to be kind and loving and gentle and caring and compassionate. You've also taught him how to con and manipulate, and I've never been thrilled with that, but um, <laughs> apparently you have to take the good with the bad. And, and I share that with you for this reason. If just sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous were enough, my son would have never had a problem. But just sitting here isn't enough. You have to do the work. And my son had a journey that alcoholic men go on. He went places that no human being should go, and he did things that no human being should ever have to do. And I got in the ring with his disease. I'm powerless over alcohol. I'm powerless if I'm drinking it, or I'm powerless if I get in the ring because you're drinking it. Whenever I get in the ring with alcohol, I lose, and I got in the ring with his disease, and I was getting beat up really, really badly. He moved to Northern California. He called me one, called me collect at work, which is always a nice touch. And... Um, <laughs> He'd been in an accident and he needed 120 stitches in his head and it was going to cost $140. And I said, oh, my God, give me the address of the hospital and I'll send a check. He said, oh, no, they need cash. I said, well, you're in Northern California. I'm in Southern California. I, I don't know what to do. And he taught me how to wire money. And I wired the money. And about two weeks later, he called me collect at work. And he'd walk through a plate glass window and he needed $120 for stitches and uh and I wired the money, and about two weeks later, he called me, and he'd done something, and he needed $120, and uh, 
Now I told him, I said, Patrick, you need to go to AA. And he said, I'm not going to be Patio's son. And I hang up on him, and he called collect again, and I'd cuss on him a little bit, and I'd hang up on him, and he'd call collect again, and I'd wire him the money. And uh, <laughs> and I'm wiring him the money, and I'm pretty soon I got four or five money gram stores going because I don't want the 17-year-old clerk to know I'm wiring the money again. And, uh, and I have stories all over town about why I'm doing it. And I'm doing everything wrong but this. I'm coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm telling you. I'm telling you that I sent the money one more time. I'm telling you that I verbally abused my child on the phone. I'm telling you. And the men and women of Alcoholics Anonymous would say things to me like, Patty, aren't you embarrassed? You're 23, 24, 25 years sober. Aren't you embarrassed to be sharing this? I want you to know this. If I am ever too embarrassed to come tell you the truth, I'm going to be drunk. And I don't want to drink anymore. So I come here and I tell you the truth. And on October 23rd, 2002, my son had moved back to Southern California, and he called me one more time, and he asked for help. And God will do for me what I cannot do for myself. God won't send me money in the mail because I seem to be able to go to work. But God will do for me what I cannot do for myself. Because my son called and asked for help, and out of my mouth came these words I would have never spoken to my son. I said, Patrick, I can't help you anymore. Stay where you are. And I called a man in Alcoholics Anonymous, and thank God I called somebody who understood the traditions. Because when I called him, he didn't tell, say, tell the boy to call me. He said, where is he? And I gave him the address of that motel, and he went and picked up a newcomer, and they went and got my son, and they brought him to the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And for the last nine years, you have done with him what you have done with me. You haven't told him what to do. You've shown him what to do. I came to believe, I admitted that I was powerless, and my life's unmanageable, why would I think I can manage yours? We don't tell one another what to do. We show one another what to do. And you've shown him what to do. And my son's an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He and I share a meeting on Wednesday night, and a couple of years into his sobriety, a young kid came up to me at the meeting, and he said, Are you Pat O's mother? And I went and found my son. I said, I will not be Pat O's mother. And, uh, <laughs> And because he's an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, he chaired ACUPA when it was in uh, when it was in Southern Ca- in Orange County, and uh, they had asked me to be the Saturday night speaker, and and he was chairing that meeting. And when he introduced the speaker, he said, "I want to introduce tonight's speaker, my mother and my hero." And I started to cry because I thought, "How do you get there from where I was on October 4th, 1975?" There was no way to get there except for the power and the magic of the 12 steps of recovery. How do you get there from where I was in court? Seconds and inches, as Norm Alpe used to say. If I'd have made a different decision in court that day, to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis, I'd have missed that moment. And uh, he and I shared a pitch one night. He was a 10-minute speaker, and I was the main speaker. And in his 10-minute talk, he's looking at this room full of people, and he's telling them about the angst of growing up without a father. I never knew it caused him any problems. But he's talking about the pain of growing up without a father. And he said to this room full of people, but my mother's a blackout drinker, and I may never know who my father is. And I thought, oh, great, you've just outed me as a slut. (laughs) And it was one of my proudest moments. And those of us who are parents, we never rocked our little infant child and thought, oh, honey, one day one of my proudest moments is when you and I share at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And on November 29, 2006, I was in a hospital room at South Coast Medical Center in Laguna Beach when my grandson was born. And I was photographing the birth of my grandson because he taught me in Alcoholics Anonymous to always have a job. If you want this to be yours, have a job. If you want this meeting to be yours, have a job. Don't just come here and sit. Have a job. If you, I have, every meeting I go to, I have a job. I have a commitment at every meeting I go to, and I have had commitments for 36 years at every meeting I go to because I want it to be mine. I don't want to just be a guest. I want it to be mine. And so I had a job that day. I was photographing the birth of my grandson. And at one point the doctor looked at me and he said, this is a good shot. And I know a little about the female anatomy. I'm thinking, this is not a good shot. <laughs> and, uh, and just about then, my grandson's head was born. And the doctor turned the head, and I looked into the eyes of God. And I looked behind him at his mother, and I looked at the, into the eyes of God, and I looked behind her at my son, and I looked into the eyes of God. And I stood there that morning, and I realized for, at that time, 31 years, You have one brick at a time taken down that brick wall that I have built between me and you. 
and you have allowed me to stand here and look into the eyes of God. And my grandson was born, he walked into my heart, and he changed my life. I have learned to love in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have people that I love and people that love me, but I have never loved at the depth that I have been able to love since this little boy was born. He's five years old. He has never done a single thing wrong. <laughs> I pick him up every Tuesday from daycare, and I walk in to get him up and pick him up. He runs across the room, and he grabs a hold of my leg, he said, Graham, I'm so happy that you're here. Seconds and inches, I'd have missed that. If I'd have made a different choice in the courtroom that morning, to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis. One Monday, my son called me. He was running late at work, and he asked me if I could pick him up from school. And I said, sure. And I went to pick him up, and he comes running across the room that evening, and he grabs me, and he looks at me and says, Grandma, you might be confused. It's not Tuesday. <laughs> and I love him. I absolutely love him. If you offered me a quart of Jack Daniels for him, there's no way. If you offered me a case of Jack Daniels for him, there's no way. If you offered me a truckload of Jack Daniels for him, absolutely no way. But if I take one drink, I will give him up in a heartbeat for the second one. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis. Not an easy choice. But if you're new here tonight, I can guarantee you that if you choose to live by the spiritual basis that the person next to you is living, I guarantee you a life beyond your wildest imagination. I'm going to end with the story that puts it all together for me. It's the story of the man that goes to see St. Peter, and he asks St. Peter to show him heaven and hell. And St. Peter takes him to a room and says, hell on the door. But when they open the door, inside the room, it's a banquet. Tables and tables and tables of food, any kind of food you'd ever could ever imagine, as much food as you'd ever want. And in that room, amongst all that food, people are starving, they're hungry, and they're dying. And the reason that they're hungry is they have those long wooden spoons tied to their hands, and the spoons are just a little bit too long, and they can't quite get the food to their mouth. So they're sitting amongst plenty, and they're starving. And that's how I was before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was out there amongst plenty, and I was starving. And then he took him to a room marked heaven, same scene, tables and tables of food, as much food as you could ever imagine, any kind of food you'd ever want. And the people in that room had those spoons tied to their hands too. And the spoons were just a little too long. and couldn't quite get the food to their mouth. But the people in that room were full and they were happy and they were content. And the reason was is that one man was taking a spoon full of food and he was feeding the man across the table. And he was feeding the person next to him and she was feeding somebody else. And that's how Alcoholics Anonymous works for me. I don't have my own answers. I have to come here and I have to let you feed me. And every once in a while, if I'm lucky, I have an opportunity to give a spoonful of this to somebody else. And you don't have to have 36 years or 30 years or 20 years or 5 years or 1 year. If you have one day, you have something to feed to the man or woman sitting next to you. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength to continue to choose to recover. I don't have it. Howard's drink and use. I did that for 13 years. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength to stay here. I don't have it, but you do. And when we pray tonight, the person on my right will give me a little courage, and the person on my left will give me a little strength. And if you have one day, you have courage and strength to give to the people sitting next to you. When I was four days sober, an old man told me if I didn't drink, I wouldn't get drunk. And if I didn't get drunk, my life would get different, and he didn't lie to me. And I end with this. I always end with it. I end with it because it's been my experience, and I pray, God, it's your experience. And it's a line in chapter 5 that we already heard read tonight. It's a line that says, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.